Uh, he was a star in football player at the University of Nebraska Lincoln until he suffered a career injury, back injury. Anyway, that's, I'll let him tell you the rest. Well, thank you so much for having me. And I just wanted to thank everybody who helped coordinate the event. This is amazing to see, and uh, it's a real blessing to, to be able to be able to witness it and be a part of it. So thank you all for coming. Thank you everybody who's organized it. Uh, a really great event. And I will say, at the end, when I've been talking, think of some questions, because I would love to do a Q&A afterwards. And um, yeah, so think of any questions that you may have. So I will get started. I grew up in northern Indiana, very close to South Bend, close to, that's familiar to Notre Dame country, you may, you may recognize that, not grew up a Notre Dame fan. I grew up in small town Indiana, played football growing up, and eventually found my way to the University of Nebraska, here before that I'll show you. That, uh, this may not mean much to some of you, but uh, that picture there, we've got Bo Pelini, who was the head coach of Nebraska at the time, and uh, Corey Yeoman, who's the head coach of Penn High School, where I went to school at the time, and no, in no time have either of these two individuals ever been pictured smiling with, an, with another person, and I got them both to do it at the exact same time, so hopefully we can get some smiles in the crowd here, maybe, but uh, that was me in high school, hopefully looking a little bit different than I do now, and again, I went and played at the University of Nebraska, where I was the starting football player. They did some pretty fun games, some pretty cool places. Right there was in 2013 against Northwestern. If you're a football fan, you may remember it was the Hail Mary catch with two seconds left in the game. Uh, Jordan Westerkamp caught a pass. And that was the one and only time I'll ever find myself in a dog pile. Because what they, you know, it all seems fun on the outset. But what they don't tell you is that there's, there's a certain levels of football players on the field, right? You've got the quick guys, who are the, the wide receivers, quarterbacks, and you've got the guys like me, the long snappers, the kickers, punters, maybe not the fastest, and then you've got the offensive linemen, defensive linemen, the 300-pounders, the real big guys. Uh, well, how dog piles work are, you've got the fast guys that get there first, and then you've got me, and then you've got the offensive, defensive linemen, and, and so if you're any bit claustrophobic, don't ever uh, jump into a dog pile. So, but a pretty fun place, got to... Uh, and eventually win the Gator Bowl against Georgia that year, played at Michigan in front of 100 plus thousand people. We were the first team to beat Coach, I'm sure that was Hogan at the time, um, but the first team to beat him at home, and that was the, what eventually led to his demise as the head coach at Michigan. Got to beat Penn State, played some pretty fun places, and made one big tackle against Minnesota my freshman year. Uh, but if you're a football fan, you'll see that I wasn't grabbing the right place and uh, caused a 15-yard penalty. Now, what I tell my coaches at the time was, you know, these guys all missed tackles, and you've got 56 and 74 left. I think that grabbing the face mask was the good option. They, they on the other hand, did not think so on the sidelines. Uh, and there you go, my 15 minutes of fame on ESPN, 15-yard flag. <laughs> But there, that's where I was. I was a starting football player. I was a top two recruit coming out of high school, a five-star athlete, and uh, had plans of playing college football and ending up playing in the NFL. And that was really my goal, my dream, and it was all happening accordingly until the off-season. I came in as a true freshman, started every single game, and uh, that eventual off-season ended up suffering a career-ending back injury. It was uh, under a squat, rock, squat rack. Stepped back, and just like that, the lights went out. And um, over the course of the next about three months, I did tried a little bit of everything, knowing that if I was going to have surgery, that that would uh, be the end of my football career as I knew it. So we tried acupuncture, physical therapy, water therapy, going to chiropractors, just physical, you know, everything that they could think of. But in the end, my back ended up getting worse. It was a broken back, and found myself at 19 years old getting ready to go into a surgery that would hopefully put my back together and I would hopefully wake up and be able to walk again and have a normal life. And so six and a half hours, oh, there, there's actually, there's where I was. That's a picture I like to show about before and after, so you can see i changed a little bit. Uh, that was taken the, my freshman year in college when I was around 260 pounds. And there I am, six and a half hours later, 
They put Humpty Dumpty back together again, but a long road was ahead of me in recovery. I had to pretty much relearn how to walk. I was limited for months and months, and I found myself at a place where I never expected to be. I always thought that once my college football career was over, or my NFL career, or wherever I was done with my athletic career, I would go ahead and just get on the treadmill and start exercising, right? I was 250, 260 pounds at the, in that picture, and um, really just, unfortunately, at a point that I thought I'd never be, right? Where I was 100 pounds overweight and unable to exercise. And again, thinking previously that if I was ever going to need to lose weight, I would just do it by exercising means. And that led me onto a path of searching. Because as a former athlete and someone who did exercise a lot, trying to lose weight without <laughs> exercise was something that was new to me. And so I was a student at the University of Nebraska, also at the time, and I was studying livestock production. So you're here now. We're going to be talking about the plant-based diet for beginners, a book all about eating whole plant foods. While I was in college, I was studying livestock production. And what I like to say is I have a four-year degree in breeding, feeding, fattening, slaughtering, slicing, and serving every animal Old McDonald ever dreamed of. <laughs> now, it's not something that I'm necessarily proud of, but it is a part of my past, and it is a degree I received, and something that I utilize now uh, in helping those in animal ag, either get, into, uh, get out of animal ag, throw vegetables, but also hopefully regain their health, as I have. So I'm in my animal science classes, 100 pounds overweight, with a broken back, just got out of surgery, and where do I lead, or where do I lean to in beginning to ask questions about diet and weight loss? Well, I ask my professors. They're experts, they're doctors in their fields of nutrition, metabolism, and I begin asking them, what should I do to lose weight? I came out of surgery, I'm 100 pounds overweight, so I'm kind of just at a loss at where I should be, what I should be doing, and they, of course, lead me towards the animal-based diets, things like ketogenic diet, a low-carb diet, the JJ Virgin Skinny Diet, all the diets that are built around their paradigm of eating as much animal products and animal protein as you can with the hopes of having better health outcomes. So I did that for months and months and months, but eventually I found myself at the same point. I would follow one of the diets for months and as soon as I veered a little bit, I would either regain the weight or feel just as bad as I did previously. And even while I was on those diets, I really didn't feel much better, and many of them I felt worse, hoping that I would feel bad, lose weight, and then maybe be able to get off of it. And as many of you have probably experienced, that's just not a sustainable way to live, <clears throat> eat, or lose weight. And so the real um, tipping point came when, uh, there I am, walking back, walking, again, relearning how to walk, um, but the real tipping point came when I'm sitting inside my animal science class, just like here, and looking at one of my, it's a, it was actually a nutrition class, and looked over at a friend, and I said, you know, there's something wrong with this picture. And she said, what's that, Gabriel? I said, I've been asking, you know, Professor X about how I should lose weight. He's been giving me all this great, you know, the science that seems legitimate, it sounds wonderful. It's not working for me. And she's okay, okay, well, that makes sense. And she's like, well, what's the problem? And I said, well, for the first time ever, I realized that Professor X was 300 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> and quite possibly, I should stop taking advice from my 300-pound nutrition professor. <laughs> and so at that point, uh, I was led to a new way of looking at diet and health. I thought that, hey, I've been trying all the animal-based diets, and really didn't know any people eating plant-based or any vegans or any, anybody who didn't recommend eating as much animal products as possible, but I thought, I've done everything else, I guess I should give it a try. And that's a question that I re receive a lot is, um, some, someone may come up to me or someone may message me or email me and say, you know what, I've tried all the diets and I haven't lost weight, what should I do? Should I begin exercising more or should I do this or that? And I'll say, have you tried all the diets? I'll say, yeah, I've tried this, 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 that, this, that. And I'll say, well, you didn't mention a whole food plant-based diet. Have you tried that? I'd say, no, but I've tried all the diets. I'd say, okay, okay. And that's where I found myself, right? I tried all the diets, except for the diet that uh, we're all kind of here to hopefully learn about. And so, at that point, I am here now. I'm a, I own a vegetable, vegetable uh, farm out in Verina, but uh, that's where I was. And I'll tell you what happened with me. I started to learn more about a whole food plant-based diet. Uh, basically, deciding to cut out all animal products of my diet, 
And um, at that point, I started to see a little bit of health benefits, thinking that, oh, if I cut out all the animal products, then I'll be really healthy. But unfortunately, I didn't follow a whole food plant-based diet originally, meaning that I was not, you know, I was still eating a lot of processed foods, a lot of meat analogs that you see at a lot of grocery stores under the plant-based um, guys. And um, it wasn't until I started to really dive in and got a call from our mother, or my mother-in-law, my wife's mom, and she, uh, I was about six months into my plant-based journey and got a call to hear that she had had a diagnosis of breast cancer. And they had known that we had been eating a plant-based diet or a vegan diet, more so what we were eating there originally. And, um, and we had sent them some information and at that point she was pretty receptive to it. So she, she decided to get on it. And at about that point in time is when I really decided that, hey, I'm going to really go in full, full, uh, you know, full force into the health aspect of it. And at that point, I cut out the processed foods, cut out the oils, and, and decided to go a whole food plant-based diet and get in more into that. And I'm sure we'll have some questions on, on those specifics of the oil or processed foods. But um, at that point, I decided to go all in, and over the course of the next two years, I was able to lose 100 pounds about an average of one pound a week without any exercise for about 85% of that duration due to the fact that I was, ex I was limited to the point where the first you know, good while after breaking my back and having the surgery, I was really limited to, I had a walker, if I needed to use a restroom, I could go 10 feet there and I could come back to the living room and then after I was done sitting in that living room chair, I could go to the bedroom and fall asleep. And uh, you know, not a great way to be when you're 19, 20 years old, I, I wouldn't recommend it, but that's where I found myself. And, um, and so that's a big question I do get a lot is, well, you just exercised a right, you were a, or you exercised a lot. You just worked that weight off, and, and really I wasn't able to. I didn't have the luxury. And I would have loved to exercise while I was losing weight, but myself, and I'm sure some in the audience, and some people you may know don't have that luxury. And so having the ability to lose weight, regain your health without exercise, is a great asset. And uh, to dive deeper into my mother-in-law, my Mother-in-law, my, my wife grew up on a pig farm. My father-in-law was a pig farmer since he was about yay high. And he's in his 50s now. And two years ago, about two years ago exactly, my, uh, my mother-in-law comes down with the breast cancer diagnosis and decides that you know, they're gonna go through the standard care. She goes through the, she has surgery, radiation, the whole, um, the whole you know, gamut of all the, the standard protocol until her, her doctors say, all right, well, we've done everything on that end. Now we're ready to prescribe you a chemotherapy pill for the rest of your life. Wow. And as someone who is you know, in her 50s, expecting to have an old, another whole half of her life to live, uh, that didn't sound too attractive. And so all that information we began sending her, she decided to hey, maybe, maybe give it a try. And <clears throat> at the time, again, my father-in-law, a pig farmer, decides that, you know what? If you're going to give a whole food plant-based diet a try, I'll cut out the animal products. I'll give it a try. And, um, and I just want to say that because I really do know that that there are quite a few people that you may have a health condition, your loved one may, and to be able to see my father-in-law show the type of love, an unconditional love, to say, you know what, it goes against everything that I'm living off of, my career, how I was raised, but I'm going to give it a try because I love you, and uh, he was able to do that, and they don't, they don't have a pig farm anymore, he got out of the pig business, and they've eaten a whole food plant-based diet for two years now, and uh, my mother-in-law, completely cancer-free, my father-in-law, who was pretty healthy at the time, and he was in agriculture, so he was out working all the time, and he noticed some even better benefits, some great benefits too. He lost weight, got off his blood pressure medication, got off his uh, cholesterol medication, which for years and years and years, his doctors had told him, it's genetics, food's not going to change it at all, and uh, he was very excited to be able to sit down in that, uh, that doctor's office and uh, have his doctor come and say, hey, you're, everything looks great, keep taking the meds and keep going, and he said, well, I haven't taken them for three months, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, now I'm not saying you should just go off everything, you know, but uh, work with your healthcare professionals with that. But uh, know that whole food plant-based diet does have, uh, does have the power to, to change health. It does have the power to really, really do make a big difference. And uh, this is not my mother and father-in-law. Hopefully you can see a bit of a problem. Maybe not now, but maybe a resemblance back then. This is my mother and my father. Always my number one fans, people who had supported me since I was you know, playing peewee football, and uh, the greatest people on the planet, if you ask me. Um, my wife and my sister are probably, probably close up there. 
Uh, but mom and dad here, as you can see, mom, growing up, everybody, you know, mom was always overweight, obese, dad was overweight, obese, dad was teetering 275, 300 pounds while growing up, and um, that was the way it was, you know, while I was playing college football. Um, and I began experiencing the many benefits of a whole food plant-based diet, like losing weight, reducing inflammation, you know, regaining my health, uh, building back the strength that I had really lost after my injury, and uh, was really trying to get my parents to get on board, saying, Mom, Dad, I'm seeing all these benefits. I'd really love to see you adopt a plant-based diet. I'd really love to see you, what a plant-based diet can do for you. And, you know, in Indiana and all their friends and just how they lived for the past 50 years, my dad's 60 years. That was just, wasn't jiving with them. Um, and, and against, you know, as much as I was hoping it would. And it wasn't until I received, let's see here, wasn't until I received a call from my mom, and this was two, around two Christmases ago, my, my, my dad, who was a college football player, probably, probably looks like he can still pad up and be an offensive lineman for someone. Uh, he was a college football player, has a total new shoulder done, two total, total knees, called him the bionic man, but he, um, <clears throat> he got a call from my mom, and he had been in the doctor's office, and he had an infection in his knee. And this was while I was, you know, in college, after, after I'd been done playing football, again, I'm seeing the benefits of a plant-based diet. And um, mom's crying on the phone, it's close to Christmas time, says, they're saying they're going to amputate his leg. And um, the reason being, back when I was in high school, about four or five years previous to this incident, he had had an infection in the same knee, and uh, re replaced the knee. And the doctor said, if it ever happened again, we're not even going to mess with the chance of an infection spreading from your knee and going into um, your whole body. And so they told him at that time that they were planning to, you know, amputate his leg. And if you know my dad, which I don't know if you do, but my dad is one of the most active people, I would say, on the planet. He's a workaholic, but he wears that like a badge, I would say. He's always cleaning the church. He's always running around, mowing the yard, doing everything he can for 12 hours. And uh, if he could get a little bit more daylight, he'd use it up. But uh, get the call, and at that point in time, I told my mom, I said, well, let me know what the doctors say. And me and Erica, my wife, Whereas Dr. Miller made the decision that I would step down from my position. I had graduated at the time, and um, I would move home. I would leave Erica at Nebraska while she was finishing up her PhD, and I would move back home and hopefully help my dad and mom <coughs> regain their health. And uh, I, that is a big thing to ask of anyone, but I get asked a lot, and I would say I would hope that anybody would make that choice for the people they love most on this world, in this world, on the planet. And so uh, I did, packed it on up home, but on two conditions. And those conditions were, I'm going to cook every single meal for you while I'm home. Mom said, great, I don't have to cook. <laughs> Dad said, what do I have to lose but my leg? And I said, there's another condition. And that is, you're going to eat everything that I cook for those three meals every single day while I'm home. And again, Mom said, great. And Dad said, that sounds all right. And so... Made my way home, and over the course of the next five months, um, you know, the doctor said, hey, you got all this going on, we'll let you give it a chance. They put a pick line in, you have antibiotics running. Still, with the doctor saying, we're going to schedule you up for, an, for, your, for, you know, just to get rid of this, this infection. We're going to have to do it, but we'll let you try to fight it. And so uh, I come home for the next four, four and a half months, cooked every meal for mom and dad, um, Dad, at the time, to give you some backstory, while they are fighting the infection in his replacement knee, they pulled the replacement knee out, put a block in, and so he was in a wheelchair for those four and a half months. And so, so anybody, if you see the next slide, you can't think that, oh, he was up on the treadmill for three hours a day at the gym. Uh, he was in the wheelchair, uh, bossing me around 12 hours a day. So, uh, but over the course of the next four and a half months, Dad was able to lose somewhere around 50 pounds, and uh, you can see him there. Uh, big difference. He's standing, as we can see in that after picture, and so uh, they were able to decide that, you know what, the infection had been fought and um, felt even better because now he had 50 pounds less on those knees, less stress on those knees. They were able to put it back in a replacement knee, and he is happily running, not running, excuse me, he should not be running, um, but uh, walking very fast. Uh, he probably does get on a little bit of a sprint once in a while, but... Uh, Cleaning the church, cleaning the house, mowing yards, mowing the church, uh, doing everything that he can um, to help out. He's one of the one of the greatest people that I know, and so it's it's amazing to think that I would hope that 
you know, I would think that without the help of a plant-based diet, or without the help of him regaining his health, you know, my wife and I are planning, or not planning, we're expecting our first child here the second week of January. And um, to think that Grandpa Doug would have been in a wheelchair, um, or wouldn't have been able to run around, run, roll around, take the kids to the park, or grandkids to the park, um, is, a sad, is a sad image that I'm not going to have to experience now. So I'm, I'm blessed to know that Dad is... Uh, Dad is doing so well, and hopefully can be a bit of an inspiration to, to others. And here again is mom, dad, and I didn't mention my little sister, but that's Gracie, 19 months younger, my little sister. And so Gracie always being uh, my best friend growing up, um, probably as we were in high school, we probably had gotten a few more fights than maybe best friends would. Um, but uh, amazing person who uh, was actually my first plant-based beginner. You can see the book, The Plant-Based Diet for Beginners. And uh, it all, it's the accumulation of everything that's happened here in the past three, four years. And Gracie decided as soon as I got on a plant-based diet, this was before my mother-in-law, this was before my parents, this was really before my wife. Uh, Gracie, always taking advice from her big brother, said, you know what, that plant-based, that vegan thing uh, sounds interesting. She cut out the animal products and... Um, is now someone who helps others adopt a plant-based diet, and she's known as the Midwest Vegan Queen on, online, but she's a wonderful, a wonderful advocate for this way of eating, and mom, you can see there, you know, never someone to say that didn't try, right? She always tried. If there was, if there was an exercise scheme, if there was a new diet that came out, a new weight loss pill, this or that, you know, she always tried but always felt like maybe she was doing something wrong or there was, there was a problem with what she was doing or that she just didn't find the right thing. And, and that was a tough thing to see growing up, right? You, you see someone who wants so badly to be in tip-top shape, their best health, but feels like maybe they're, they're, there's something wrong with what they're doing. And, um, but it wasn't, until, and that was the case until I got home and really helped them uh, see what a plant-based diet can be. So here's the big... Drum roll for everybody. Um, that is mom, dad, Gracie now. Uh, if you maybe knew them previously, you walk up to them and you would think you just went back in time 10 years. So again, dad down, in this picture here, dad's down 75 pounds, Gracie's down 60 pounds, mom's down 70 pounds. All the way amazingly, and all, um, some of my first plant-based diet beginners, people on Beyond proud of, and um, and I'll you know put them side by side there just so we can all see. I'm, I'm so glad that they did this. <laughs> this turned out really good. As I was in college and away in Nebraska, you know I was not in the family pictures, and um, I would have loved to kind of show one right there. And I'll show you one, but it's just a, a huge difference. Um, and and how, what I think about is, you know, it did take a sacrifice. I stepped down from my job, left my wife for four and a half months. Um, all with her blessing, of course, but, uh, but it did take a bit of a sacrifice, but it wouldn't have been possible without two things, and I don't think that I needed to necessarily do all that, but I think if I would have just done these two things, given enough time, it would, have, it would have all worked out, and that's love and leadership, and those are the two big keys that I think, if we're all in this room, we can all close your eyes, and you don't have to, but if you close your eyes, you can think about three, four, five people that you love more than anybody else on this planet that you know a healthy way of eating could really change their life. Could either keep them alive right now, they may be dealing with something serious, or keep them around for a long time to be able to spend time with their children, grandchildren, loved ones. And uh, when I did that, when I closed my eyes and I could think, Mom, Dad, Grace, and there was a few more, but those three top the list. Um, but it didn't happen because I preached to them. Didn't happen, I'm sorry, Pastor, I wasn't preaching to him. Uh, it didn't happen because I was yelling at him, because I was angry at him, because I was mad they weren't doing this or that. It happened because of those two things, love and leadership. And, and I'll just dig into a little bit here. It's because I think if you really want to change the health, the life of someone that you love, or, or someone you know, number one, you have to love them. Because had I have not loved them and just wanted them to adopt a plant-based diet or regain their health or lose weight or be around for their grandchildren uh, and just yelled at them or told them they're doing something wrong and not had that love, um, you know, I think we all have experienced that. It's not so, uh, you're not so key to change when you experience that. And so you got to love them. And loving them means that I had the information for them to adopt a plant-based diet, for them to regain their health months, 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 and years before, or a year before, um, you know, they really made that decision. But because I loved them, 
I understood that maybe it was two weeks, maybe it was two months, maybe it was two years, maybe it was going to be 20 years down the road before I was able to really help see that change in their life. And so I had to love them. And then two, I had to lead them. Uh, this is a big one. It's sometimes a lot easier to love someone than to lead them. And so in leading them meant that I couldn't tell them all the wonderful benefits of a plant-based diet. I couldn't tell them how much they needed to do this or that. I had to show them what a whole food plant-based diet would do. I had to show them that I was losing weight, that I was regaining my health. And so I just want to just mention that, that if you know someone that you really do believe could really see the benefits of a plant-based diet, after you yourself do, you've got to love them, because guess what? They may not take that advice today, tomorrow, maybe five years, ten years down the road, but if you love them, they're going to still be around, and you're still going to have that information formed, and if you lead them, they're going to know right where to turn, because you're not the fat vegan or the fat plant-based eater who's eating potato chips and Pepsi and Coke, right? You're the image of health. You've gotten off medications. You've regained your health. You've reinvigorated your exercise routine to where you feel better and are doing better than you had decades before. And they are going to know where, right where to turn. And so I hope that that makes sense, love and leadership. But here's a few more pictures here. That's us all there. Um, you can see a lot of double chins. Probably more chins than you may have seen in a picture before. And uh, here we've lost the chins and gained a wife daughter-in-law and sister-in-law. So Dr. Miller's there. That was during her graduation, during her PhD ceremony. But uh, there's mom, dad, Grace. And so I think I might have them. There's the before, there's the after, just so everybody sees. And there's Dr. Miller and myself and future baby Miller. This was taken this summer out at the Veg Fest here in Richmond. And I uh, just wanted to close with this before we get into some, um, some question and answers. But this is this is the future. We've got a baby coming into the world, and I'm asking you, I'm pleading you, I'm hoping, putting hope in you that, that the future is much brighter and will be brighter for health and for all of our family and loved ones, for those that are coming into the world and those that have been on this planet for 60, 70, 80 years, that your health and your life can, can really, it doesn't have to be what it is. It can be improved right now. You can see those health benefits, and you could feel better. Hopefully, baby Miller doesn't feel 10 years younger but, uh, when he first gets here, but uh, you yourself may feel decades younger and healthier on a plant-based diet. And so I'm so blessed to be able to be here, speak in front of all of you, to be able to see this congregation, this group of people, make the changes that really are needed but are also simple and easy to do um, to regain your health, lose weight, you know, and, and, um, and reach your health potentials. And be around to be a blessing, to be a great grandparent, to be a great friend uh, for many, many years to come. And so thank you all for having me. I would love to answer questions specifically about what I ate, about the diet, about the book. Um, anything that you may have, we'll get into that. But thank you so very much for having me out here. It seems like you moved mighty fast. Where did you get all your information and education to jump into it to where you did? That's a really good question. So where did I get the information to first kind of get into a plant-based diet? And um, so initially, I was again studying livestock production at the University of Nebraska. And it just so happened that at around the time where I began questioning my 300-pound nutrition professor, you know, <laughs> shocker that it took me a while to do that, um, but around that time, I just so happened to be not only questioning what, what I was hearing nutrition-wise, but somewhat questioning what I was hearing in the more practical information from my nutrition professors or my livestock professors. <coughs> Things like how much water it takes, the thousands of gallons of water it takes through the, the order of feeding an animal to produce a gallon of milk, to produce a quarter pounder of beef. Um, but I was hearing it from my animal science professors in the way of Here's how we get that cow to drink this much more water to produce this much more milk or produce this much more meat so that we can get that bottom line a little bit better. So I was learning that, and that all seemed, seemed to make sense uh, until I watched, uh, it was a Leonardo DiCaprio documentary called Before the Flood, talking about some of the animal agriculture practices, some of the climate practices, the, the different things that were happening around us, and they began to present, my wife and I were sitting down watching it, and they began to present some of those, some of that information, all right, the thousands of gallons of water, you know, to go into this cow, or they go into this milk, and Erica, 
sitting next to me. She goes, wow, that's really, that's really something. That's crazy. I, would never, I said, that's not crazy. I learn about that every single day in my classes. <laughs> we just see how, much, how we can get that cow to drink a little bit more water. And at that point, I, you know, I'm looking at her saying it like it's you know, point blank or you know, that's just how it just makes sense. And she's like, are you serious? And I said, yeah, I guess I never thought of it like that. And so took that to my classes, and, and that was really where I started to see maybe that's not the way to go, maybe more plant-based. And, and then I started to read and got, got hooked with some, um, some great information from doctors like Dr. McDougall, Dr. Esselstyn, as I'm sure some of you follow. Um, and started to see the, that, you know what, this plant-based thing isn't just a new diet like the ones I've been following. This has been around for hundreds of years, and if you go back even before that, it's been around for a thousand years, right, of different people and populations that have been eating that way, that have been eating the diets built around foods that I like to call the simple starchy staples, foods like rice, beans, potatoes, oats, corn, quinoa, and sweet potatoes, the foods that you could name a population that has a long-lived group of people, and um, they're going to probably have been building a diet around some of those foods. And so at that point is when I really began you know, cutting out the animal products, and like I said, took a little bit for me to realize that, hey, that oil, that processed food wasn't so healthy, uh, but luckily it didn't take me so long to where it was really, uh, I wasn't able to uh, cut it out very fast and uh, start to reap the benefits of a plant-based diet. So it was about that time where I started to say, you know what, this stuff I'm learning in my animal science classes, maybe not so sound, and maybe not that great for the future that I'm hoping to have, and the future that I'm hoping my children get to have, um, and then realizing that, hey, I could play a role in that with my diet, and, um, and it also could help my health. Does your wife, uh, she uh, is her doctor in plant-based so my, my wife is a mathematics professor, at uh, she's a math professor down at BCU, and so she is uh, Dr. Miller, so I so affectionately call her on the interweb, uh, but yeah, so she also eats a plant-based diet, a uh, whole food plant-based diet. It took her a few, a little bit of while to get onto a plant-based diet, I will say. We, I was eating a plant-based diet for about six months, and that's around the time, a little bit before, where my mother-in-law called breast cancer diagnosis and you know at, the, at that point we had been eating all plant-based at home you know Erica said you know what I'll support you I won't I won't have a steak at home or I won't eat animal products at home knowing that you're cutting it out she said you've been going through these months and months and months of these fad diets I'm not gonna follow it <laughs> but I'll respect it at home she said because I just got done learning how to cook keto I just got done learning how to cook low carb I just got done learning how to cook this or that I'm not gonna learn how to cook vegan and, uh, and so I said, you know what, that's great. I've asked a lot of you, and I'm not going to ask you to you know, go into this you know, full bore right away. And, um, but it was, and, and so that's how it was. We would eat plant-based at home, but if we went out, I said, you know what, I'm not, I'm not your boss, I'm not your dad. If you want to have that at the restaurant, you can. And so uh, she did that, and she didn't really see much difference or much benefit while doing that. You know, eating probably 80%, 75% plant-based at home. Uh, but it wasn't until, and she, again, she had watched all the videos, she had read or, you know, heard about the books I was reading from the plant-based doctors and the research I was reading, uh, but it wasn't until her mother called, and my mother-in-law called and said, you know, I've got breast cancer, and her mother had breast cancer, and, and my wife's sitting next to me, and I can just remember her, you know, just kind of saying out loud, you know, it's a very sad moment, her mom's doing this, she said, it would be irresponsible of me to continue eating the way that I'm eating, the dairy foods, the processed food, um, the high-fat animal foods, knowing that my mother has this, this disease, my, mother, my, my grandmother has this, um, all while seeing that research that's, um, that's so clearly evident out there of the links between dairy, breast cancer, high-fat animal foods with breast cancer, prostate cancer. And so at that point is when Dr. Miller, or she wasn't Dr. Miller at the time, Erica, uh, made the decision to go 100% whole food plant-based. It hasn't looked back. She's maintained a healthy body weight, is um, carrying a very healthy child by all accounts, and um, yeah, has been a wonderful, wonderful asset to have in them, you know, helping others adopt a plant-based diet. It's now a great resource for others. Yeah? When you first started, did you just start cold turkey, or did you sort of start eliminating the dairy a little bit at a time, just sort of stretched it out? And then went into the whole base? That's a really good question. So did I begin 100% plant-based, or did I go cold? Or, you know, did I go cold turkey, or did I uh, just kind of ease into it? My, me personally, I jumped right into it. I was again 
I kind of had realized that the things I was learning about my animal science, my livestock production classes, uh, were not only against what I believed for my health, because I realized that they weren't, you know, benefiting my overall health, but they also weren't benefiting um, what I was hoping the future was going to look like, you know, climate, water use, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so, for me, I realized that, you know what, I, I did go cold turkey in that aspect. I cut out all the animal products. Now that I still have the junk food I was all, already eating, but I made sure on the back of the label it said, no animal products, okay, I'm going to eat that too. Uh, I still did that. So I wasn't eating 100% healthy, but yeah, I went cold turkey. Um, you know what? Um, I would um, I would say that either way would be okay. I think that you, as an individual, could probably gauge that, right? You could probably say, "Am I a better person to just give it all up, or am I going to be someone um, who tries to give it up slowly, but in three years I'm still kind of just cutting down a little bit, a little bit, a little bit?" Um, and I would also say that depending on your health. Uh, would play a big role. If you are someone that is being recommended by a doctor or someone who has a chronic disease that is plaguing you right now that is causing serious health, um, health effects, um, then I would very, very much recommend a cold turkey, 100% plant-based approach because you don't know how much time you have and you don't know when that, um, when that standard American diet uh, is going to um, you know, reach its tipping point. Yes? So you were talking earlier about like that's a good question. So organic or conventional foods like produce and uh, different plant-based foods? Well, there's a great, um, a great resource, and I've actually have it in the back of the book, but you can find it online very easily, called the Clean 15 and Dirty Dozen. Those are just the clean foods that are very low pesticide residuals on them that you could buy conventional at, say, a grocery store, knowing that, hey, you know what? Organic, conventional, I'll probably be all right. And then there are things like the Dirty Dozen that are the 12 foods that are, if you buy conventional, are going to be the most highly sprayed, most high um, amounts of pesticide um, residue on them. And so that's a good resource. Now, do I follow that 100% all the time? If a food's a Dirty Dozen food, do I make sure I buy it organic all the time? When I, when I can. Um, but if I'm out, if I'm you know, out of town, if I'm cooking for someone, and you know, we've only got a food line, available. Um, it's not so much of a concern of mine. Now, do I feed Dr. Miller, who's carrying my child, the dirty dozen foods? No. We, we can buy organic in those. Uh, that's made me a little bit more conscious of that. Uh, but luckily, a lot of those dirty dozen foods, those more highly sprayed, high pesticide residual foods, are ones that are not the staple foods that you're going to be building a diet around. They're more so some leafy greens like kale, which is a wonderful food, but you're not going to get your calories from kale. And if you don't like kale, you don't have to eat kale. It's not a mandatory food on a plant-based diet. Uh, but those foods like rice and beans and sweet potatoes and um, oats are ones that you may... But, but, but those staple foods, rice, beans, potatoes, oats, corn, quinoa, sweet potatoes, the great thing is that whether you buy... you know, That's where you're going to be getting the majority of your calories on a whole food plant-based diet. Um, whether you buy those organic or conventional, the cost is still so low. Whereas if you're buying organic, specialty this or that, you know, Mizuna or all, you know, you go to Whole Foods and you see all those there, like, you, you still find that the simple starchy staples, those foods that you're going to be getting the majority of your calories from on a whole food plant based diet, are going to be inexpensive either way. And many of them aren't on the dirty dozen list. so. Conventional organic, you're going to be okay. But again, that resource is online. That's a good one. It's not something we necessarily focus on too much because, again, those simple starchy staples are so low in pesticides. Uh, and another thing to think about is um, just the bioaccumulation of pesticides is how that works. And so even if you were going to get some of those dirty dozen foods, those super highly sprayed foods, um, they're going to be up there like something like uh, GMO corn or soybean. But what, you don't, what a lot of people don't realize is that you're never going to eat that GMO corn or soybean the majority of the time. What's going to eat that GMO corn or soybean is that cow, pig, or chicken for the next 6 to 12 months. And then if you were to eat that cow, pig, or chicken, you'll have eaten the 6 to 12 months of residual, you know, of, of the residue that is built up. And so animals are bioaccumulators. You and I are bioaccumulators. And so if you're eating a whole food plant-based diet built around simple starchy staples, even eating conventional, you're still going to be doing so much better than even someone who's eating, you know, all the organic produce but still eating meat, fish, chicken, um, 
that is a bioaccumulator of those things that is eating that. You know, in, there's you know there's there's arguments for both ways. You know, grass, you know this or that. But uh, but to be safe, really, the, the simple starchy staples with the addition of fruits and vegetables are going to be your best bet for the low pesticide um, residue on there. Yeah. Question. We normally have lunch about 2 p.m. and today at about 11 o'clock, I got hungry. So. What do you do when you want a snack or something to fill in the gap between meals? That's a really good question. So what do I do if I get hungry before lunch or I need a snack? Uh, first of all, I'll say that many a days, for Dr. Miller and myself, breakfast looks like a big bowl of oatmeal, maybe a cup of oatmeal each with some slice of banana or some fresh fruit or some blueberries. And uh, that will fill us up a good amount, but you know, if we have a later lunch, say 1 or 2 o'clock, 11 or 12 o'clock rolls around, um, I'll do a couple of things. Now, I work from home, so I have kind of the luxury that I can go back to the kitchen and have another bowl of oatmeal or make some, uh, make some, make some rice and beans. Um, but for Dr. Miller, who's on campus all day, she doesn't have that luxury. And so I pack her uh, maybe a little bit more lunch or another container that has a snack, and this is what it normally is. Uh, it's normally going to be a snack that's built around those simple starchy staples. So things like rice, beans, potatoes, oats, corn, quinoa. So um, for her, I'll send her an extra bowl of some cooked brown rice with some cooked black beans with some salsa on top that she could have at 11 o'clock if she's getting hungry before 2 o'clock. She can fill up and she can even decide that, hey, I'm just going to eat all my lunch now or that's when I'm going to eat my lunch uh, if she has it available and she'll fill up then. Or we'll send her some uh, big sweet potato, maybe with some cinnamon or maple syrup on top. She wants to have that for lunch or um, some baked potato that I've sliced up into wedges that I've either baked on parchment paper to make fries or thrown in the air fryer. Uh, and she can dip that in some barbecue sauce or ketchup or just have them as they are. So it really, we don't, there are some good snack foods. And, you know, I've got some in the, in the book, things like a granola, very easy to make. But a lot of times we just kind of rely back on those simple to prepare, easy whole food plant-based recipes and or just the foods, the simple starchy staples, uh, that we'll just add a sauce on to or something like that. So just try to keep it not as complicated. And I also will say, for someone who finds yourself snacking all the time, you know, you could do a couple things. You could have a bigger breakfast. <coughs> but for me, I normally just I'll normally just go back to the fridge. If you if you have access, you know, if you're at home or you're, you know you have access to it. I would just go back to the fridge a few times while I'm working on the computer and fix myself a bowl of rice and beans or fix myself a sweet potato. You know, again, and we might get into it, but and, and in the book, I really do focus a lot of attention onto it, is the simple starchy staples. Those foods that people and populations have built diets around for thousands of years, um, and that healthy populations who aren't plagued with the chronic diseases that are you know, destroying our healthcare system, like type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and obesity, um, those are the foods that I want you to have cooked and ready to go in your fridge. So a big pot of brown rice that I either cook on the stove top or in the Instant Pot, let it cool, put it in the fridge. A big pot of black beans that I either cook on the stove top in the Instant Pot, um, in the slow cooker overnight, let it cool, put it in the fridge, so that whenever I get hungry, or maybe Dr. Miller had a long day, I had a long day, I was out doing something or working around the farm, we both get in late, we're not just pressed to have to go to you know the restaurant or you know just go hungry. We can pull out some brown rice that's already cooked, pull out some black beans that are already cooked, warm them up, put some salsa on there. We've got a wonderful meal. Yes, we maybe put some greens on there, some sautéed greens and some vegetable broth, uh, or just a fresh salad. But uh, but the base of that is those simple starchy staples that were already cooked. We pulled them out. And we were never more than five to ten minutes away from a cooked, ready-to-go whole food plant-based meal. And that is, that's where I think a lot of benefit can be had in just, if you take nothing away from a whole food plant-based diet or the book or information you find, just to know that you can cook those simple starchy staples, have them on hand, and build m the majority of your meals around them uh, in just a few minutes makes a plant-based diet one that is uh, not so hard to follow, not one that you're so easily going to fall off of, uh, but it takes that diet part and makes that lifestyle really quickly. So you go from a plant-based diet to a plant-based lifestyle um, much smoother, much easier, and much quicker. Do you use my microwave? Um, we do not have a microwave, not because we're against microwaves. My parents have a microwave. I love them very much. And if I felt that there was 
enough to say, don't have a microwave, I would drive up there and pull it out myself. Uh, for us, we renovated a 100-year-old schoolhouse out on the east end that is a 1,000 square feet. And uh, I tore down all the walls. I completely redid the house last year. And 1,000 uh, square feet does not have room for too many appliances. And so our appliances, I have a big rule in the kitchen that if I put an appliance on the countertop, it's got to be able to do multiple things. And a microwave does not fit the bill. So my toaster oven also air fries. It also convection ovens. It also toasts. My stand, you know, my, my, um, my blender can also process, can, can do a lot of things. And so the microwave just doesn't fit that bill. It's a quick appliance and it can be used, you know, you may have, you know, you could have uh, opinions on it, and that's that's great. We don't have one, so I really don't have an opinion on it, other than um, we find that a toaster oven can warm things up in 10 minutes, and save in six, seven minutes isn't worth having another big appliance on that countertop. Well, they say a microwave radiates your food and cures the nutrition in it. Yeah, there's there's definitely a lot out there. I, I would say that going for if you're going to eat a, a standard American diet without a microwave or a whole food plant-based diet with a microwave, and I know that's not, you know, that's not the two equations, I would always lean towards the, state, the whole food plant-based diet with a microwave. Um, but uh, if you work your way out of a microwave, that's fine if you want to. Um, but I wouldn't say that I, would, I, wouldn't make, I wouldn't create a barrier of going from the standard American diet to a whole food plant-based diet um, thinking that, oh, I've got to have a microwave to use that. Um, and I don't want to use that. So just, you know, you can, everybody can make their decision on that. And there is some great, great resources out there for it. Um, but we just personally have, uh, have that rule that it's got to be able to do more than one thing in the kitchen. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Isn't a piece of fruit a good snack? Piece of fruit's a great snack, yeah. That's, what I um, do. that's a wonderful snack. I, I, I should mention with the snack question, I, and I forgot the thing you reminded me. We always have bananas on the countertop. Some oranges, you know, whatever we, you know, we find at the grocery store. Bananas, oranges, apples. sitting on a, apples sitting on the countertop, so that if we're hungry for something, fruit's a great option. It's, um, you know, high in water, high in, high in fiber. It's a wonderful, wonderful snack. It's you're know, going to fill you up like many of the plant-based foods or the simple starchy staples. They're going to fill you up without filling you out because they're so high in water and fiber, so that you're going to be able to fill up without you know overeating and, and really be able to. Not only you know, lose weight, but also maintain a healthy body weight by filling up on those foods. And, and fruit's a great option there, especially for snacks, especially if you've got kids, grandchildren. We always like to have those around. Um, just they're just wonderful, <coughs> wonderful food. It's, it's in nature's package, right? Too. It doesn't need any plastic. Doesn't need anything. Have a banana. Have an apple, and uh, just go right ahead. Yeah. Even a glass of water will help you. A glass of water will help fill you up too. Stay hydrated. That's definitely definitely a big thing too. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Well, I heard you mention about um, maple syrup and cinnamon. What about like honey mustard? Are there other things you can use to add flavor? That's a good question. So, thinking like sauces. Yeah, I, I, I've kind of been leaning towards honey mustard, but I'm not sure if it's really appropriate. So, so I'll just, I'll just answer the, the honey part first, just, just because I do have a, an opinion on it. Uh, we don't use honey. Because I, I'm a, I eat a whole food plant-based diet, but also live a vegan lifestyle, um, which may mean nothing to you, it may mean something to you, uh, but honey in particular, the majority of honey is, and, and if someone did want to get in, the, get in the talk about it, we could afterwards, but uh, as a farmer, a small-scale farmer, grows my own produce, open-pollinated produce, I rely very much on bees, but what I don't rely on is European honeybees, which is where you're going to get the majority of honey from. And so just from an ethical standpoint, and as a farming standpoint, I don't use honey because those European honeybees are where you're getting that honey, are where we're getting a lot of the problems, and they're not even that great of pollinators compared to our, uh, our natural bees that are kind of getting, um, unfortunately, uh, getting... Um, Getting the sickness from those uh, unnatural bees here. So, but to answer your question about sauces that may have some sugar in them, may have some salt in them, right? Things like salsa, barbecue sauce, sriracha. If you talk to any of the whole food plant based doctors and you look at the research, um, pretty much all of them are eating whole food plant based foods as close to their natural state as possible, meaning we're eating potatoes that have been steamed, maybe mashed with some vegetable broth or some almond milk, but we're not eating potato chips, which have been sliced, dried, fried, you know, <laughs> so, you know, all the things. So we're eating whole plant foods as close to their natural state as possible. 
you can put a little bit of sriracha on there, some barbecue sauce, some salsa. You're not going to negate all the wonderful health benefits that a whole food plant-based diet has to offer because you put some sriracha on your burritos or some barbecue sauce on your mashed potato bowl, right? As long as you're, you know, again, we're not talking about sauteing things in oil, adding a bunch of processed junk, throwing some chicken, you know, we're talking about whole plant foods. Um, that are closer to natural state as possible, adding a little bit of sauce on there is fine. And I will just cover the salt topic because I know it's a big one. Some of you may be thinking, you're here, you've got to cut all your salt out, you've got to do all this and that. And again, I'm not a medical professional, um, but here's a great way that you can limit your sodium, limit your salt intake, while not feeling like your food is bland and you have to just wake up every morning hating life because <laughs> food doesn't have flavor anymore. Um, the first thing is, as you cut your salt down, your sodium intake down, your body's going to naturally start to be more receptive to that salt in your food. Um, but the three biggest, the three biggest players and the three most, you know, saturated in sodium foods that you could be eating are processed meats, cheeses, and processed junk food, both vegan and non-vegan alike. And so on a whole food plant-based diet, we're cutting out the meats, we're cutting out the cheeses, we're cutting out the processed foods. Again, eating whole plant foods as close to our natural state as possible. So we're cutting out those three biggest problems when it comes to sodium. And so with that being said, if you were to go to my house right now, you would find a salt shaker there. Now, I don't, you, you'll see, and I, I get flack, and, and, and trust me, I, I do, because people will try my recipes, um, and they'll say, it didn't have, it wasn't salty enough, or there wasn't enough seasoning. And of course, all 75 recipes are completely salt, oil, and sugar free. Do I recommend you never use salt? No, but I do recommend that while you're cooking, you don't pour salt into your recipe. Because as you're cooking, say you've got a big pot of mashed potatoes, some vegetable broth, um, some almond milk, you know, you're just making an easy mashed potatoes, you could very quickly put two, three, four teaspoons of salt in there, mix it all together, cook it, mix it all again, put it on your plate, and then four out of five people at your table are gonna say, just doesn't have enough salt on it. I need some more salt. That's because it just gets diluted when it gets mixed. That's just a natural thing. Of course, the sodium's there because it didn't go away, uh, but it's that flavor that you get. So what I recommend is don't use salt in your recipes, but also don't serve that to someone who's not, who doesn't know that and say, you should love this. You need to tell them and know yourself that there's no salt in the recipe, but feel free to put some salt on with the salt shaker on the top layer of your food because as soon as you go in to bite that mashed potatoes, that salt that's on the top layer, it's going to hit the roof of your mouth, it's going to hit your tongue, and you're going to reach, you're going to see and feel and taste that saltiness with so much less sodium compared to diluting it, mixing it in, and or getting it in those animal sources. And so um, that is a big thing. I, you don't have to live without salt. It's just that uh, you cut those three big, uh, the three big salty foods out, and then also um, cut it out of your the recipe in general and just add it at the table. Because, again, if you're someone who cooks for others, you'll know that you know, Jack and Jill and Buck and you know, Becky, they all have different salt preferences. I could put two tablespoons of salt in a recipe and one of them thinks it's way too much, one of them thinks it's not enough, one of them just doesn't like the recipe, and the other one is just, uh, you know, is perfect. And so what I like to do is, I don't put it in the recipe, put it on at the table as much as you need. You could just salt, 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 and you're still not even going to be close to the amount that would go in if someone was adding it in scoops into the recipe. So, hope that so, so mustard and ketchup maybe, but not the honey. And if you if you follow the, the theme of, of what I was saying there about the honey part, but yeah, we, we use mustard, we use ketchup in our home. We're not using we're using better ketchup, right? It's not full of high fructose corn syrup, so uh, ones that maybe have an organic sugar in there, right? Not recommending that you maximize that in your diet, but here's the deal: if you're gonna if you're someone coming from eating you know 80 percent you know 85 percent ground beef burgers, and you know with lettuce, tomato, pickles on that you know that burger. And you're going to start eating a whole food plant-based burger, like a Luau burger for my recipe, or the 3 one burgers that I have on the website, or any of you know the easy-to-bake whole food plant-based ones. Don't expect to put that on your on your bun with lettuce, tomato, and then and pickles, and then say Ugh, it just doesn't taste the same. Well, because you were drenched in barbecue sauce and mustard and ketchup, go ahead and use some barbecue sauce and mustard on there. Yeah, don't feel bad about that. Remember, you're getting rid of the majority of it, and you can always get better. You could, of course, make or find better options, and there are some options to make a ketchup in the book. There are options to make a barbecue sauce in the book, uh, but don't let that be don't let that be the reason you don't decide to follow a plant based diet. Anybody? All right. Well, thank you all so very much. Loved the discussion time. 
I will be over at the table. Uh, the books are $15 if you're interested in getting one. I don't have the card reader tonight, so I can just take ca uh, cash or check. But if you if you do if you don't have either of those, the books on Amazon, you'll be able to get it by Monday next week, um, or Barnes and Noble online or somewhere around there, um, or maybe talk to someone to see. But but I have them over there. Answer any questions you have. I just want to say thank you so much for having me. Um, let's give a round of applause to everybody here. <laughs> You're an inspiration to so many, and I'm, I am cheering you all on because, um, you know, you're few and far between, but hopefully the numbers are rising, and, uh, and you're all uh, going to go home and lead and love your family and friends this holiday season. I know it. Thank you, Gabe. You never do like that. And maybe you'll come back and tell me what. Of course. I'd love to. Thank you so much. And he will be over here if you want to I Thank you.